Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome again to uh, Monroe Live podcast. And I'm here with <coughs> his eminence, John McElroy. <laughs> here, you may kiss my ring. Uh, you don't even have a ring. Oh, I, I, you yeah, can I kiss to, something else. I had to hawk that. <laughs> the business is so bad. I had to sell my rings. He sold his. So anyway, um, John and I have known each other for a long time. And uh, we're going to definitely get into talking about uh, the current state of the industry. In fact, we were getting so excited. Um, <laughs> Eric had to come in here, shut us up, cool us down with a hose. And um, and he wants us to talk a little bit about our sordid past. So um, the first question of the day will be, John, how did we meet? Oh, you know, uh, my first recollection of you was at some industry presentation. I think it might have been the SAE World Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, my recollection is that it was at what was then called Cobo Hall. Yeah. You know, where they have the Detroit Auto Show yeah, and all yeah. that. But SAE World Congress was always there. And, and maybe it wasn't that show, but that's sort of along the lines of what it was. And there was this guy up on stage giving this presentation about how he had redesigned the front end of the Ford Ranger pickup truck and taken out dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of parts, and yet the truck looked exactly the same as before. Yeah. It was just using your lean principles, design yeah. for profit right. ideas and all that, and combining parts together and doing yeah. things intelligently so that you reduce the number of fasteners, the amount of labor, the number yeah. of parts, and blah, blah, blah. And so it took all this cost out, and yet functionally it was exactly the same as before. Yeah. And I thought, holy crap, I got to get to know who this guy is. And I think if I remember right, I went up and introduced myself when your presentation was done and said, I got to learn more about this. That's my yeah. recollection. Okay, so uh, what I think, uh, I think, I don't think I was at Ford when we met. I Because I, I gave very, very few speeches when I was at Ford. Um, later on I did, and that was at the behest of, um, of, um, Lou Veraldi. Mm -hmm. So Lou Veraldi and, uh, Jack Telnack both left the company. And I think it, I think it was an SME program, but I think it was the big thing they used to have, um, at the Hilt or the Hyatt, uh, in Dearborn. In Dearborn. Yeah. Because I remember getting up there and, and Lou Veraldi, uh, sorry, yeah, Lou Veraldi introduced me. And I could not believe the introduction. I mean, I was humbled to the point where, I, you know, you gag on stage and whatnot. And, um, and, uh, and uh, he said, oh, Sandy's modest, uh, just, just coax him. And uh, when you get him talking, you can't shut him up. Okay. And what we were talking about wasn't the Ranger, it was the uh, team Taurus. Yeah. Cause that was the big, big thing. And that was the front. Uh, that's what I talked about. The front bumper, uh, system where we went from, I don't know, a huge number of parts down to basically three. I still have all those, uh, those pictures. I don't use it because no, nobody knows this. Too, nobody knows those cars anymore. They're, uh, they're so, they're so old, but, but at the end of the day, he was, uh, he was a really big promoter of me, him and, uh, and Telnac, actually, he got me, um, Jack got me um, a speaking engagement, some big, big time thing. I, and again, um, he just said, I, you know what, I've got enough speeches. You got all the slides. We need to, you know, my, uh, he had obviously quite a bit of stock. So he, uh, he was very happy to have me come up there and talk about the successes that we'd had at Ford because the stock was going like this. And so was the sales and everything was, was absolutely nuts. So, so I think it was, I think it was the SME because Nancy Lurch, you knew her yes, before you right. knew me mm -hmm. and she was the woman in charge as it were, uh, of that uh, particular thing. Well, that, so. that sort of makes sense. Cause I was thinking society of automotive engineers, yeah. SAE, yeah. you're saying SME -E. society yeah. of manufacturing engineers. So in my cobwebbed hazy recollections of decades yeah. ago, I could see where I might've confused the two. Well, actually these guys gave me a tip on that before. And I said, I don't remember where they met, where we met. Somebody introduced us, and then I thought about it, and I remembered, I think it was Nancy Lurch. Could have been Nancy. Yeah, yeah Nancy right. when she was working for the SME. So right. we were all young and 
happy then. <laughs> That's right. At the beginning of our careers. At the beginning of our careers, it was, yeah. And then the other guy that uh, that got us together was uh, Jim Harbour. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, Harbour, I learned so much from Harbour. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, he was the guy who I first identified the manufacturing cost advantage that the Japanese automakers yeah. had over the American ones and showed that it's not because they pay their uh, people less. It's not because they have government support. It's not mm. because blah, blah, blah. He said they just run their damn operations better. Right. And yeah. he taught me how they did that. And that, that changed my career, yeah. literally. Well, at the end of the day, when I was, uh, uh, you know, when I knew Jim, um, yeah, Jim's past, but, but at the end of the day, he was, without a question of a doubt, one of the gruffest people on the planet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, he actually quit when Lee Iacocca showed up, said that something about the number of uh, VPs that were at Ford versus dinky, tiny Chrysler. Um, he said, there's going to be a lot of people going. And... <laughs> Jim got up and says, ah, I'll save you the trouble. And he just got up and walked out. He was thinking about starting his own company anyway. Well, he got fired. Jim got fired. Oh, I thought he... Oh, no, 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 no. He didn't quit. He got fired. Oh, Absolutely. And I'm sure it's because he was as gruff as he was. He'd, he'd tell you the truth. Uh, and he didn't care what you thought about the truth. Yeah. He was just going to deliver it to you. And, uh, and that forced him to go start off on his own to do consulting. And then it was uh, a guy out of M MIT called Dr. I think it was Dr. Jim John, you know, it, it, <laughs> kind of a weird name, but he hired him uh, because Harbor knew all the stuff. He was a finance guy, finance yeah, guy right. by training who went into manufacturing. I've never known anybody in the industry that followed that career path ever before, yeah. since yeah. anything. And so Harbor really looked at manufacturing with a financial set of eyes and uh, started to see things instantly that nobody else saw. And so MIT hired him because the Department of Transportation wanted them to do a study of how come the Japanese are kicking Detroit's ass. And uh, Jim came up with all these things that showed, hey, it's, it's got to do with quick dye change. It's got to do with Pokeyoke. It's got to do with the, yeah. the five houses, you know, all the Toyota production system stuff. And... Uh, he turned a number of Detroit executives on to that. There was uh, uh, guys at GM, Ford, and Chrysler who, quote-unquote, got it. I mean, they, they knew what uh, they were really up against. But uh, they weren't really free to talk, certainly not to the media, like me. Mm. Not, not uh, on the record, certainly. And, uh, but anyway, Harbor opened the industry's eyes to, hey, look, this is what you're up against. And if you don't yeah. start changing the way you do things, you're going to get your clock clean. Well, they got it cleaned anyway. Yeah, they did. <laughs> but they, they did learn. Slow. Yeah, they, they moved too slow. It's like what's going on in the auto industry right now with right. the Chinese showing up. Right. I mean, unbelievable numbers just came out. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you're looking at uh, China. Uh, China sold 700,000 vehicles in June. And the U.S. sold 175,000. I mean, holy yeah. doodle, this is a lot. And now you've seen BYD has kicked everybody out of first place. Right. Geely is, I think, in number four. But, I mean, Volkswagen, oh, my God, and General Motors, and all these guys that used to control the market, have, they're really having a problem. They're losing and, it. Yeah, and right. they're losing it for the same reasons. They all drank the same Kool-Aid. And in the past, in the olden days, well, we got to have a lot of inventory, just in case. Oh, okay, good. And um, die changes, just leave them in there until the die just <laughs> falls apart. I mean, why should we change it? Okay, this is like the whiz, quiz, the whiz kids. That was all their. That's that was all their big stuff. You know, don't change dies. Stock is handy. You know, you never can tell when you're going to need it. Um, uh, beat the workers, uh, squeeze the suppliers. I mean, it was. It, all that stuff that came out um, in the late 40s and early 50s, right. that, that put them right in the old barrel that, uh, that says, uh, this is going to turn to garbage. But, and now it's like, what do you mean we're going to do EVs? Oh, we're making <laughs> big V8s. Well, that, these, are the, these are the things that, that come along and you, you need to say, you know, really what we need to do is move away from that and move to this. And I can remember... I can remember when uh, the first Harbor report came out and um, I didn't know, I did know Jim, but only because 
sometimes we'd speak on the same, uh, you know, same circuit or something like that. But, um, but I didn't know him well enough <laughs> to know just, uh, just how much people might not like him. But I remember uh, I was giving a speech, and I think it was, in, it was at Cadillac, and, um, and Gary Calger was there. And the other guy that was there that I <laughs> really didn't care for was uh, Roger Smith. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, Nobody he, liked Roger. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, um, yeah, and he, he proclaimed in front of this big, giant audience at uh, at Cadillac that uh, that he was going to sue this I can't remember what spl- expletive but right into the dark ages or something along those lines yeah that didn't happen <laughs> yeah 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 no Roger uh, boy he left GM in shambles he really did in fact yeah. if you remember the very last thing he did as chairman and CEO was get the board to approve a million dollar a year increase to his pension. This is back when a million bucks yeah, was a million was bucks. A, a lot of money. And uh, as soon as he retired, the first thing that the, the board did was rescind that raise. Oh, really? Yes. I did yeah. not oh, know yes. that. Oh, yes. Wowzers. Well, that was the only good news that <laughs> came out of that board meeting <laughs> ever. Yeah, I, uh, uh, he had a, he, I mean, I will never understand um, ever uh, why Bob Stemple was released. I know he was the patsy, but just think about it. If he would have stuck around, GM had a, a, an EV1. GM, uh, we worked with Hughes, and we took the, uh, the uh, uh, actually it was Dan McCarthy, one of, one of the other guys at Monroe, and he took the, um, uh, what do you call that thing, the inverter, and it was the size of a, like a steamer trunk and shrunk it down to something the size of a, an attache case. And now that sounds like ridiculous. Everybody started laughing. But in those days, that was big, big stuff because we didn't have all the, um, all the uh, chips and whatnot that you've got now. These things are big old hot chips. How do I cool this thing? And in fact, it was liquid cooled. I can't remember what they used. <laughs> it must have been liquid nitrogen because these things really got hot. But at the end of the day, his vision would have put General Motors uh, way ahead of everybody else. Well, B- Bob Stemple was the right guy at the wrong time. Yes. And uh, he, here's what really happened. It, it, very interesting. You know, General Motors, uh, if, if you were the, pr- the president of Chevrolet, and that's what you were called, the president that's of correct. Chevrolet or Oldsmobile or Buick or Pontiac. Well, Chevrolet or any was of our as Cadillac. big as Ford at one time. Or, that's right. Yeah. So if you were the head of Chevrolet, you ran literally a car company. You were in charge of all design, engineering, manufacturing, sales, service, after service. Everything that had to do with Chevrolet, you controlled it. There was no centralization at that point. And then uh, Senator Phil Hart of Michigan started to get worried because General Motors had roughly 50% of the U.S. market. Well, that's that's an an oligopoly that is controlling the market, damn near a monopoly. And they started talking about uh, breaking up GM. They were going to break Chevrolet off from uh, General Motors because it was half of GM in volume at that point. And so GM went, ooh, we don't want to break up the company. So they said, we got to start reorganizing the company so that we have centralized operations that cannot get broken up. And they formed what they called GMAD, General Motors Assembly Division. So now... Pontiacs and Chevrolets would be assembled in the same plants. Buicks and Oldsmobiles would get assembled in the same plants. I think Cadillac was still pretty... Cadillac was still the same, but it used to be CPC and BOC. Well, well, that's where Roger totally destroyed the company. Uh So anyway, they they had the centralization to sort of stiff arm the feds and not break up the company. And then in 1984, Roger Smith, then chairman and CEO of the company, had his famous reorganization. And that's when they formed CPC, which was Chevrolet, Pontiac, and Canada, and BOC, Buick, Olds, and Cadillac. And they were grouped into two operations. And if you look at a chart of GM's market share in the United States, you know, it's... it's at 50% circa 1970 or thereabouts. Uh, then the Japanese arrive on the scene. GM loses a little bit of market share. Not a whole lot, though. It was more Ford and, uh, and Chrysler that were losing share. Mm-hmm. And you get to 1984, and that 
that market share chart starts to take a nosedive from which it has never recovered. Right. Never. Yeah. And so what happened? You know, Roger created all the centralization. So instead of, you know, Buick trying to punch Oldsmobile in the face or, you know, Chevrolet stomping on on uh, Pontiac's neck, all this great creativity and competition going on, everybody fell in line and they did everything that they were supposed to be told and they lost all of that initiative. Yeah. And it just became so bureaucratic. Yeah. Well, um, it's always interesting to look backwards because, you know, at the time, everybody loved Roger. Oh, my God. Wall Street who Journal not, couldn't couldn't say enough good about except him. for Marianne Keller. She just oh, she hated she him. ripped him oh another God. one. Oh, and, yeah. and in the yeah. end, Marianne turned out to be right. She was right. Um, I I listened to her give speeches. I mean, a lot of if I was going to New York, chances are good Marianne Keller would be in the audience, or sorry, uh, one of the speakers, and I would be like, uh, you know, in the tail end of the worst possible position right after lunch. <laughs> Everybody's ready for a nap. <laughs> yeah. But but at the end of the day, um, when Stemple came in, um, you know, we, we gave him the same, you know, the training on how we think about uh, our product and whatnot or how product design should be done using the Monroe system. And we gave that to the upper executives. We gave it to Gary Cowger, Lloyd Royce, um, uh, Bob Stemple, everybody that was at the top, including the finance guys, everybody got it. And I had one component, uh, you know, a before and after kind of thing. And I would use this thing always on executives because it would take them somewhere between, if they were really good, three minutes um, and upwards of, you know, his hands are trembling so much and he's dripping with sweat. It's time to uh, let him off the hook. And Bob Stemple watched me put it together. And he said, well, I can see right now what the problem here is. And he started giving an engineering analysis on why that didn't work and how you had to do it upside down to what the, the process sheet showed. And he went, nin, 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 and he could do it as fast as I could. And I was the one who redesigned the damn thing. So if you turned it upside down and you aligned these little D-shaped, uh, uh, it was it was for a shock absorber, then you could put it together, but you had to hold it, and then there was a spring. You had to have like five hands to put this thing together. The redesign went, dun, 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 <laughs> done. Okay, so so he, 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 he was the only it. one that, he got it. I never had that with anybody else, never. I bet you I did that a thousand times, easy. I still got it. I, I don't use it much anymore, but I mean, he was wicked smart when it came to that. Right, right. His ideas on what the future was going to be were like almost uh, mystic. I mean, I, I couldn't believe how good he was. And when he got the sack, well, uh, two things happened. He got the sack and then they brought in... Um, Jack Smith. No, it? no, the guy that really buggered it up. Jack Smith was just a puppet for Wall Street. But no, uh, what was that guy's name? Ignacio Lopez. Oh, Lopez. He, well, he was the purchasing guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. But see, here's the problem. You know, uh, I want to say Bob Stemple, uh, uh, Roger Smith retired. I can't remember. It was like 1990. And uh, Stemple took over and he was sort of like co-CEO almost with uh, Lloyd Royce. Or Stemple was CEO. Royce was president. Yeah. Uh, Mark's father, for those yeah. who are yeah. listening who may not be aware now, but the president of General Motors today, his father was president. And uh, by the time they inherited the company, and they were the right guys, but it was the wrong time. Roger Smith had screwed that company up so much yeah. that their, their hands were literally tied. And then if you remember, 1991 was the first Gulf War. The U.S. went into a recession. General Motors lost, if I remember right, something like $21 billion. There was a bunch of things that added up to it all. And the board went, oh, you guys are out of here. Boom, boom. Both Royce and Stemple were fired. Well, it, actually, I remember that for sure because Bob Stemple and Lloyd Royce were kind of close. And Lloyd had nurtured uh, Bob into a position where the next thing you know, he's leapfrogged over him. But, uh, but I know that Bob Stemple was very unhappy when the board told him he had to fire Lloyd Royce. And his question was simple. Who in the world do I, do I get to replace this guy? I mean, who's been groomed to take his place? Who's, who's going to have the, all the experience and whatnot? And then 
you know, one, well, actually, two. And, now that I remember it, it was Jack Smith that took over after yeah, that. Yeah, it was Jack. And yeah. Jack, if you remember, had been running Europe, GM Europe. Right. And they were making a billion, two billion profit every single year. I mean, right. everybody was like, holy crap, how did he do it? And so, so Smith got the job, Jack Smith. And he had this purchasing guy in Spain who had really impressed him. He had brun, brought him up in the ranks of GM Europe. And then when Jack became CEO, he said, Inyaki, come on over to North America and start doing your magic. And uh, holy, I, I knew Inyaki very, very well. He and I got along famously. Yeah, really? Serious. Oh, famously. Uh, he'd tell me all kinds of stuff and all that, but boy, the supplier community, they hated him. He was do you, unethical. Do you, oh, unethical, the man was <laughs> evil. So do you remember you had, uh, with Automotive Industries, you had a, um, um, uh, a program and it was for the tiers. It was only the tiers. And I was the second speaker, second or third speaker. Um, Jim was first. Jim Harbor. Jim Harbor. And I came on after that. And I had a joke. Do you remember the joke? I don't. Was? I don't know. So uh, there's a secretary at General Motors, and the phone rings. She picks it up, and um, guy on the other end says, "Yes, I, I'd like to uh, speak to um, uh, Lopez, Mr. Lopez, please." And she says, "Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lopez is no longer with us." Oh, oh, okay, thank you. Hangs up. Next morning, same thing. Can I speak to Can I speak to Mr. Lopez, please? Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Lopez doesn't work here any longer. I oh, know where this is you. going, yes. Yeah, and the third time, <laughs> he phone, this same guy phones up again. I'm sorry, Mr. Lopez doesn't work here anymore. Didn't you just phone yesterday and the day before? Yeah, I just enjoy hearing that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the place went nuts. It went nuts. Everybody was up there screaming, yelling. Nobody expected, nobody expected that ending. Oh, but that was all, I mean, every supplier hated his guts. When I had my special meeting with him, first thing he said was, I need you to steal every secret you can from every supplier because I'm going to shop all these things around. Everything's going to be a commodity, blah, blah, blah. And I said, uh, that, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. That's, that's wrong. Uh, you know, I, I'm one of those churchgoers that really is a churchgoer. And, uh, and he, he said, well, well, you might as well get to the point. I think you're getting too much pay for blah, blah, blah. And he was, he, he was going to cut us, I don't know what we were at, like 2500 a day or something like that, down to um, 500 or something ridiculous. And, um, and I got up and he says, you must sit down and negotiate. And I said, I don't think so, friend. I know evil when I see it. I quit. And, or actually, I'm firing you as a customer is what I said. Walked out, grabbed Dan McCart. We, everybody that was in the company was, was in the audience because he had just given a speech about how he was going to work closer with the, uh, <laughs> with the supply community. And then he pulls me in and he says, okay, go steal everything they've got. Bring it back so I can farm it around. I'll, I, and I'm telling you what, I could not believe it. And then the other thing you may remember, I was at the Frankfurt Auto Show. Did you hear about this? I don't know. Wait. I was at the Frankfurt Auto Show and I walked in. So Ignacio now can't leave Germany. He's been locked in. He already... Yeah, so quick filling in for the audience. Yeah. He, uh, Volkswagen approached him. They, they liked how badly he was screwing the suppliers and begged him to come do it for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so they stole him away from GM, and he walked out the door with boxes of materials, and he yeah. took all his top lieutenants, yeah. and they walked out with all kinds of secret stuff, future yeah. product plans, pricing, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, uh, GM sued Volkswagen successfully, and uh, you're right, uh, Inyaki was, uh, he dared not step foot in the United States ever he couldn't again. Get out of the, he couldn't get out of Germany because he wanted to go and visit his mom or something like that in Spain. And I don't know how it worked, but, but somehow he made things happen. But I mean, really and truly getting out of, and by the way, you know what else was absolutely brilliant? I was at GM for this one. When, when, uh, sorry, when Jack Smith was standing at the microphone, I, and now I just, I wanted to tell you that uh, Inyaki, uh, uh, yeah. Lo, Mr. Lopez is going to be taking over the presidency's position. I, I, where, does anyone know where he is? 
He had no idea he had buggered off that yeah, night. Right. And I watched that thing on TV, and then somebody came over and said, uh, Jack, uh, uh, Ignacio has left. Uh, he, he's stolen all kinds of good stuff, and he, he walked, what? What? I've, no, he can't. It was so pathetic, and everybody was howling. I mean, all the guys that, that I was sitting with, I was, at, um, I was at Cadillac at the time with a bunch of Cadillac engineers, and I was being paid through somebody else because I said I'd already quit, but they wanted me to finish some project. So I was working through, it might have been Harbor, I'm not sure, but somebody else, and then they just gave me, you know, around a, uh, you know get around the uh, the problem kind of a thing but i'm telling you uh that guy well look uh, like i said i knew inyaki very very well he was brilliant he really was but he was unethical and yeah. uh you know everybody hated him but they loved jack smith jack was such an amiable yeah. yeah, easy going yeah. guy everybody loved jack but jack is the guy who put him in there yeah. And and told him, Inyaki, I want you to take a billion dollars in cost out of our purchasing this yeah. year. Yeah. And he did it. In fact, he, he beat his number. And Jack was like, wow, that was great. What are you going to do this year? And he did it again. And he kept taking a billion out, a billion out, a billion out. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he did it by cheating suppliers largely. Yeah, squeezing the suppliers was what he was doing. It was more than out. squeezing them. You know, he would uh, demand their drawings. Well, he had... Well, he had the situation where he would go, he would send his special crew in. They would go and look at your factory, look at what you were doing, and then optimize. Because everybody that's running, if you have more than one customer, you're going to be trying to look for efficiencies. And he made it so that the GM stuff was efficient, everybody else's was less efficient. So these guys lost twice. They lost the... Um, they, uh, they, they'd lose the, the money that they were making, the profit that they were making at General Motors, plus the inefficiencies would kill them for the Fords and the Chryslers and everybody else that they were working on because now it was, it was optimized for GM yeah, but not and others. everybody else was suffering. Well, the other thing that really hurt the suppliers is he would demand their drawings, you know, CAD drawings yeah. and all that. And he would say, I want to know the materials. I want to know how you designed it. I don't want to know how you process it. Yeah. Turn that over to me. And then he'd take that and shop it out to other exactly. suppliers. Yeah. So the ones who had spent all the R&D to get there and perfect the problem or the, the product uh, saw their competitors who didn't have to spend a dime on, on uh, R&D get everything for free yeah. of uh, how to build it, and then they would bid on that basis, and they'd get the business. Well, and he was great at outsourcing. He was one of the absolute first uh, to, to start shipping things off to uh, some people. Would, you know, some of it went to Japan, but if it was simple, it went to China. It went to China or, or Taiwan, any place, any place that could give him a better price. And, uh, and I suppose that in his eyes or his mind, I mean, that was wonderful. He did his job. But again, you get to the immoral part. But anyways, I almost forgot. So I'm in uh, Frankfurt. And in Frankfurt, the Frankfurt Auto Show is gigantic. It's in a bunch of different buildings. And it's really sunny outside. So I came walking into one of the buildings. Come walking in. And um, it's really bright out. Come walking in, you walk in the dark and you're blinking. You're going, oh my God, I can't see anything and whatnot. And all of a sudden, oh, and here's Sandy Monroe, my good friend uh, from the United States, blah, 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 blah. And, and I, I can see somebody shaking their Somebody's shaking my hand. And, but now there's bright lights in my eyes. It's TV lights and I'm shaking. I'm going, smiling. Where the hell am I? It's Ignacio. It's Mr. Lopez himself and I'm on TV. Der Spiel had it on the front cover or something. It was like, uh, you know, um, Ignacio meets one of his friends from, and I couldn't get my hand away fast enough. <laughs> but, the, but that was the press that they yeah. used. Oh, my God. I got it from everybody on the planet. Oh, I, saw, I see you with your good friend Ignacio. Oh, geez. I, so, anyways, that's we should probably shift gears now. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. people are going to start... 1980 no. i wasn't even born my, my children were <laughs> yeah so um yeah so anyway we were we were talking a little bit ago about um we started talking about the uh, the issues associated with the supply community and um 
uh, Jim Farley put out a, a very famous short video, which uh, gave us the sum total of one of the things that's a problem, and that's that's the software business um, and the software that, in essence, is holding everybody back. The, the key to success at Tesla is the fact that they develop all their own software. Right. They don't give out anything. You you can give them a you can give them a mechanical box, but they'll take care of it from there. So right, but as you know, it, it goes deeper than that. It's not just uh, you know a legacy automaker going to its suppliers and saying, okay, now we're going to write the software. You know, Tesla is the one that pioneered the software defined car. Exactly. You know, where before you draw one line on what the car is going to look like, before you try to figure out the interior packaging or the propulsion system or anything like that. You define the car in software. You figure out every single function that's going to be in that vehicle. And you design a software system around that. And then you drop it onto an electronic architecture that's zonal with centralized computing. And, it, and that's how Tesla starts from the very beginning. And now others are doing it too. Other startups are doing it. I'm not sure the legacies are there quite yet. No, but, not uh, at all. So, but this is what, for example, Doug Field at Ford doing Model E is, is going to do. And he's already told the supplier community, you're not going to write software for us anymore unless you're really, really, really good at it, better than us. Or if it's some function that we don't want to have as part of the centralized uh, system. Yeah. So one example he used was uh, the airbag triggers. He says, you want them totally separate off on their own. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want those things going off for, for anything. So anyway, yeah, I, I think uh, if you look over the last decade, everyone's been talking software is the answer. That's where it's all going. And so the major tier one suppliers have accumulated these, uh, built up these substantial staffs. I think Bosch has something like 10,000 software engineers, something like that. So anyway, now what uh, the, the automakers are starting to say is, um, no, thank you very much. We'll take your hardware, but we're going to write all the software for it. Yeah, well, uh, in, the, in that little video, I don't know where it came from. It just appears on my, uh, it appeared on my computer. But he said that he's got 150 uh, suppliers that have given him 150 different softwares that somehow uh, are supposed to, kind of communicate with each other. So everybody's talking about latency, how much time there is between when the signal goes out and something, some job is performed, and you go to edge computing. Edge computing basically just means that I, I want my computer, my computer uh, chips, or not chips, but uh, boards, to be actually edge to edge to get rid of latency. Think on that and think about, okay, so uh, I have a signal uh, from my accelerator, which is designed by Fred, and it's going to go to the um, inverter or the uh, power control module, or that some power control module, and then it's going to go from here to there, and then boom, 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 and it, ultimately it winds up at the electric motor. With Tesla, that's one one signal that goes straight to the electric motor through the inverter, but pretty much in no time. Hence the reason when you step on that thing, you, you hear cracking noises, that would be your neck <laughs> right. uh, shrinking. Right. But, but that's the stuff that, uh, that he put out, 150 different software packages. They don't write it in the same language. They'd, there's no way to crack this stuff. It's like ridiculous. Right. Well, you know, look, that's how the industry grew up, so to speak. You know, so in the, the, the pre-digital world, the pre-microchip world, yeah. everything was hardwired. And then as chips started to come in, it was like, woo, you know, for engine control, for emissions and uh, fuel economy. It was mostly wow, emissions, let, yeah. let, let, Let's put a chip on there. It can do things far more efficiently. And then we needed a chip for the transmission, then a chip for the steering system, a chip for the brakes, a chip for moving the seats, for raising and lowering the windows. So next thing you know, there's a chip in everything. Every single component has got a chip in it. All of it with software, to your point, written by individual suppliers that use their own software programming, and none of it talks to each other. Not really. I mean, they have to connect it to the CAN, right? You know, yeah. The, the, and, the, yeah. the area network. 
But that's as far as it goes. And so guess what you cannot do? You can't do over-the-air updates. Impossible. Exactly. Yeah. You know, maybe you can do a module. So even like right now oh, today, yeah. it's the infotainment or the maps that can be updated in non-Tesla cars. But this is why, you know, Tesla was largely unaffected by the chip shortage. It uses far fewer chips than, yeah. than anybody else does. And this is what Farley and, and the rest of them have woken up to is we yeah. got to do software defined cars with centralized zonal computing. And uh, they'll get there in the 2025, 2026 timeframe, which means in 2025, three years from now or so, two years from now, they'll catch up to where t Tesla was in 2010. Yeah. And, and where the hell is Tesla going to be in 2025? Well, it's going to be a, it's going <laughs> to, that's not a chase anymore. You're kind of like uh, picking up breadcrumbs in hopes that you'll find it where, where they get to. But, you know, one of the things that I, I keep getting over and over again is, um, uh, you know, why are you always talking about, um, why are you always talking about Ford? Ford this, Ford that, Ford this, Ford. What about, you know, GM? What about Stellantis? What about, well, actually, the reason I talk about it is because they're in second place and they're moving faster than everybody else. And it's as simple as that. I mean, when you get right down to it, um, when I give these different speeches, we tear something apart and I, I look at it. Like, for instance, you were talking about OTA. Why, why is there no OTA on a VW, uh, the ID4? Why? Because I mean, nobody, nobody has have, had a, a, an over-the-air um, uh, upgrade. Nobody on, on, a, on an ID4. Why is that? Well, there's no aerials. <laughs> you, you have to put an you aerial a, in. You need a modem, right? Yeah, and exactly. Somehow, somewhere, you have to have um, aerials that are going to affect different boards, and there are none. So you can't do it. You can go back and maybe you can go to the, um, you know, you can go back to your dealership or what have you, and uh, maybe they can do something. But at the end of the day, that yeah. was built as a self-contained unit, so... You know, again, it's it's not a uh, software defined car. No, it, it, it is not a centralized zonal computing system in it. Yeah. Carryad Volkswagen's, you know, wunderbar kind of software yeah, yeah. effort was supposed to do that. But as you know, that rocket ship blew up on the launch pad yeah. and everything's been delayed. You know, they're saying now maybe till 2027. And uh, you, you saw the news uh, just today. Audi is going to buy an EV platform from SAIC, and Volkswagen is going to get one from Shepang. They, they just poured... Sheeping? Holy mackerel. X-Pang, okay. it looks X -Pang. like. Yeah, I think it's Xi pronounced Shepang yeah. or something like Xi that. But, yeah. but they're pouring like $700 million to get a chunk of this company. because They are so far behind. The ID Series 3, 4, 5 are not selling in China. In fact, uh, we just got word in the second quarter ID series in China sales were down 19%, while the rest of the EV segment was up 20%. Exactly. So, I mean, it's not like they're falling behind. It's like they're racing in reverse. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, we've seen the, uh, the other little deal that came out there, the roof's on fire. I have no idea which one of the executives that leaked that, but I'm sure that... You know, oh, I, I can see my house from here. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I that's can't. the new president of the the Volkswagen brand. Yeah, is the guy he had a, a meeting with all his top. Uh, yeah, I know, and it was guys. supposed to be sworn to secrecy. I I got information from one of the guys that was in that room, mm -hmm. and he's basically he says he didn't know who it was that leaked it, but that wasn't supposed to go anywhere. The roof's on fire. Um, Everybody at Volkswagen is sleeping. I need 30% uh, cost reduction, and I need it by the end of the year. 30% cost reduction? That would mean I'd have to get rid of, by the end of the year, I'd have to get rid of 60% of everything. Really and truly, that's what it is. Right. Well, as you know, the only fast way to cut costs in a situation like that is get rid of people. It's the only way. Ah, but it's Germany. I know, which is going to be damn near impossible. Yes, exactly right. I heard that if you hired in... And you were there for I don't remember what the what the amount of time is, but some minimum amount of time, yeah, they can release you, but it's going to cost you two years in severance pay. Holy doodle! How many hundreds of thousands of people does uh, Volkswagen have? Because they're one thing they did do that I was always uh, admired was the fact that they did a lot of vertical integration. 
Now, uh, with this kind of situation, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe that was not a good idea. <laughs> right. Maybe that's right. not the thing you want to do in Germany. So I have no clue what they're going to do. And they're talking about um, getting rid of, you know, a whole <laughs> the second shift. We're going to get rid of this. Holy doodle. If you, if you get rid of either the, it's actually the first or third shift. If you get rid of one of those shifts, you got to pay all these characters off. Oh, my God. I can't even imagine and then what about the supply community? I mean, the ripple effect there is just absolutely staggering. Yeah, look, look I, I think the Volkswagen group, with the exception of Porsche, is in trouble. Well, Porsche is kind that, of that, separate. Yes. But you know who's really in trouble is Audi. Yes. They fired the CEO. Um, they, when, that, when, that, when they brought in the Audi for me to look at, the new one, I've forgotten the name. I was so One of the off. e-trons. The e-trons, yeah, whatever. Anyways... I come walking over and they've got me mic'd up and it's first impressions, right? And I walked over and I said, I swore. Are you kidding me? What the? What? This is. And uh, so they cut that. And so I came back in again and, and, uh, and I changed it. And I said, hi, everybody. Hi, boys and girls. And I said, what do you see here? Looks like an ID4, doesn't it? But you're wrong. And I said, let's look at it from the back. Does it look like an ID4? Yes, but you're wrong. Let's go on to the front so we can find out what this really is. And here's the Audi, the uh, whatever, uh, uh, grill, kind of ugly. I, who did this? I think the guy that got fired <laughs> for BMW i3 <laughs> was, uh, was, hey, we need a new grill. Oh, I got just the idea. And I said, and, and I went through it and I said, all you have to do is pay 14 extra thousand and you can have an Audi. It's exactly the same, the interior, everything. <clears throat> At the end of the day, it was, um, I, I, I don't know who in the world would, uh, would want to do that. But remember when General Motors came out with uh, the Cimarron, which was the same as uh, some cheap, uh, oh, yeah. the Chevrolet J car. Yeah, the Chevrolet J car. Yeah, like J is for. Anyhow, yeah. at the end of the day, uh, that's kind of like, I don't know who's guiding or who got them on this path. No, I mean, look, but, Audi's in trouble. The e-trons are not selling. Uh, you know who's not doing a half bad job of selling electrics are Mercedes and BMW. Did you see the profits Mercedes are making? Profit-wise, <clears throat> nobody can compare with Mercedes. If, if you want to talk about the traditional kind of companies. Mm. I mean, it is staggering. Well, I, I, uh, actually, you know, if you look at the end of last year, uh, BMW made more profit per unit than, than Mercedes did. Per unit. But I was just talking yeah. about and gross. Total, total pro yeah. Gro no, no, no. Gross no. net market. Yeah, they, yeah, they, or total net market. Correct. So anyway, BMW and Mercedes-Benz are doing a decent job. Yep. I, th I want to say right now about 12% of their sales are EVs, which yeah. is much more, it's, you know, in the U.S. market. Yeah. We're at, what, 7% for the total market. So yeah. uh, so they're doing better than overall. But Audi is, uh, I want to say, 4 to 5% five, 5 of their sales are EVs right now. Mm. Well, at the end of the day, I don't, I, don't know what, um, I don't know what's going on over in Germany. Um, I really like Dietz. Uh, now I know he ran into a whole bunch of, other kind of problems but at least he saw that there was a future in in software and he hired way too many people and he hired them from germany i mean germany right now is not really classified as the epicenter of software why didn't they just go to silicon valley and get it done in fact i personally have no idea i would never even dream of creating software i would go to i would go over to uh you know Elon's back door. Hey, hi. Uh, I'd like to buy some software, like a lot of software. Uh, I just want the whole works. Um, how much would that be? Why not? Why? Why in the world would I go to? Shipping's a nice place. I mean, uh, that was one of our customers when we were in China. Okay, that's that's why. That's uh, that's fine. Um, but but sh shaping also loses more money than everybody. <laughs> Nobody loses as much per vehicle as they do. Why, why wouldn't I go and find somebody else? Why wouldn't I go to Elon Musk? Because of pride? 
Uh, I don't know if that helps your stock sales pride. Doesn't work for me. No, it I doesn't. Mean, and and look, they're running to the Chinese now for help anyway. Hey, d- d- along those lines, Elon announced that a major OEM is going to license FSD. Who's your guess? Going to license FSD. Yeah, you know, just like. Uh, Everybody's running to get uh, the NACS charging, yeah. the North American charging system. At the last earnings call, Elon said, yeah, uh, we're getting real close to announce it. Uh, a major OEM is going to license FSD. So anyway. Uh, you know what? I'd only, I'd only have one guess. Who? I'd Ford. Same here. That's exactly what I said. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Ford, Ford was the first to run over to get NACS. Why not be the first yeah. to get FSD? And I think because Ford's got a closer relationship to Tesla than anybody, um, Elon says, you know, Ford and Tesla are the only two car companies that never went bankrupt. I, I can't see them going to GM. But I will tell you one thing. If, if I had a suggestion on full self-driving, I would skip cameras, LiDAR, radar, blah, blah, and go to FLIR. Forward-looking infrared. Mm-hmm. I have done, I've been involved with, I've been involved with eight different ballistics. You drop them out of the plane and run away, okay? No power, no nothing. All you got is wind and you got little fins that make this thing go. And if you remember correctly, the bomb went, and it went right through the, uh, the, the little hole. Who, Luke? The force, Luke. Forget that force. <laughs> we have American know-how. It went right down that hole. Straight down, burned through, I don't know, how many hundreds of feet of concrete and metal and whatever, and then blew up below the, the bunker. And then the second one went in a hole and blew up beside the bunker, and then Saddam has said, oh, okay, uh, I, look at the time. Maybe we should go on. <laughs> okay. Did that, did we use radar? No. Lasers? Mm-mm. No. FLIR. Everything was FLIR. If I want it, I cannot, I know why. Oh, that costs a lot of money. Well, you know what? You run over somebody, that costs a lot of money too. And some people get really unhappy about that. I'm telling you what, if I had one suggestion, it would be go to FLIR. And if you do that, you'll beat everybody. They're, they're not the only ones out there too. There, there's no, a, no, FLIR is forward-looking infrared. Oh, 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 there's I, a bunch I, of other different. I, I thought, okay, I'm thinking somebody's got uh, a product there. Yeah, they're, they're, there's a company that's called FLIR and that's, that's fine. And okay. I've driven their cars and I, I think that's great. Yeah. But I'm talking about the technology forward-looking infrared. Right. That technology far surpasses everything else. Totally agree. No, I've, I've seen uh, systems with uh, thermal cameras on them. Yeah. And yeah, you can see everything. And you can see it through the rain, the fog, the right. snow, whatever. That's it's what I mean. Always, right. And that's, anyway, that's, that's kind of like what I would do. But if I was going to guess, and I'm sitting here, I was sitting here thinking of anybody else that, that would be able to do that. And I can't think of anybody else that would uh, would move toward that. because the, Yeah, the only other one I thought could, but I don't think they would be Volkswagen. Remember, Ford and Volkswagen had uh, invested in Argo AI, and that was going to be their, their yeah, autonomous uh, yeah. R&D effort. And then they got impatient. They, they had to invest more money. They didn't want to do that. They both pulled out. Uh, meanwhile, GM is plugging away. Amazon is plugging away with Zooks. Yeah. Uh, Google's plugging away with Waymo in China, I think. Isn't it Baidu that's uh, Baidu. off to the yeah, races Baidu. with autonomy? And, uh, yeah. Baidu, is. Uh, they, they started talking about that when I was still coming to China. They mm-hmm. thought that they should be in that market because um, Baidu is, I mean, that's the, uh, what do you call it, uh, ride and drive company over there that, you know, this yeah, well, look, I, I've else. been a huge proponent of uh, autonomy, and if, I like to brag yeah. about this. I wrote my first article about autonomous cars in 1987, and, wow. it's, and, and there was a lot of great R&D going on at that time, but it required all kinds of sensors in the pavement. It required transponders yeah. at every single intersection. It required a massive computer display array to, to control it, so it was massive infrastructure investment and no city no state no county nobody was going to make that investment right. so it it really went nowhere but there was a lot of good stuff what changed it all was the darpa challenge and out of that yeah. we got 
GPS and LIDAR and, uh, and a number of other things. But all of a sudden, that gave cars the capability of being autonomous without right. having to plug into an infrastructure. Yeah. Plugging into the infrastructure is icing on the cake, but that made it possible for cars to go by themselves. That's what changed it. And I still think that is going to be the big transformation for mobility, not electrics. You know, all electrics do are change the way you get power to the wheels yeah, to exactly. drive the car. Right. Autonomy changes mobility. It opens it up to everyone. doesn't matter how old you are, how blind you are, how sick you are, how young you are, how whatever you are. You can now have mobility that takes you wherever you want to go anytime yeah. you want it. And if the numbers pencil out the way that they're starting to look like, a whole lot cheaper than owning a car. Exactly right. And that's what I think ultimately will happen is that you won't buy a car. You, there will be companies that will buy cars, but you won't buy one. Because most 99% of the time, if you talk about ordinary people, the car is sitting in a garage. It's not doing anything. It's, it's either in a garage or a parking lot. Right. And, and not doing anything. So 90% of the time, it's yeah, just sitting exactly. there depreciating, depreciating in value. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's, that's the real vision with autonomy is that you can open up mobility for everybody anytime they want it. It's got to get to the point where I can whip out my cell phone, say I need a car, and I know, I know for a fact in three to seven minutes, there's going to be one, you know, within walking distance of me to get to and take me where I want. Because, you know, if you have a relatively new car, say three to five years old. If you look at the, the monthly payments, the maintenance, the fuel, the insurance and all that, it costs the average, this is AAA money, numbers, not my yeah. making it up, $10,000 a year to own a car, one. So if you can go to the average household and say, how'd you like to give up your car or give up one of your cars? And guess what? We can save you Three to five thousand dollars a year, maybe even more than that. I, yeah. I think a lot of households will say, "Sign me up. I want yeah. to save that kind yeah. of money." Yeah. By the way, um, I should tell you too that everybody's saying, "Well, and you press your cell, cell phone, or you've got an app, or something like that." I think uh, that's like uh, it should be passe already. It should be. Um, I need a car. Get it over here right away. And your little chip in your head, you just push that, and it reads, it hears you basically through the bones in your skull, and uh, and there's the car. I I believe that the all these wonderful uh, gizmos that were paying thousands and thousands and thousands, they're all gonna kind of like disappear, and you're gonna get that. And you know, if you want to take pictures or something like that, cell phones are good for that sort of stuff, maybe, or maybe uh, maybe there'll just be something hanging on your head like a. Like, uh, no, it's going to go through your motors. retinal nerve and take a picture with your eye. Well, you could do that, too. Actually, my eyes now are, uh, are wonderful things. I just go up to the airport, look in it, I'm, you're done. Go to the uh, customs office, look in, done. I, I mean, my eyes now are turning out to be way better than my... I have no fingerprints. Uh, fingerprints don't work for me. But I'm telling you, we're, we're in a very exciting time where technologies that uh when i was a kid people would just laugh at and walk away and other people are saying hey i got one right here you know that's that's kind of like and quite frankly uh, i don't know if i should even mention this but uh, right now we're working on a gravity and anti-gravity machine wow. how about that i love it yeah. i love it because i've always you. said look gravity is going to be the final fuel answer for everything yeah, yeah. gravity's everywhere always yeah, yeah. every everywhere and we don't really know how it works. We, no, what we do, uh, Newton said, if you drop an apple, you know, yeah, that kind of yeah, stuff. But, yeah, but, but, but at the end of the day, it's a wave and everybody, well, if it's a wave, then how do we, how do we control a wave? I mean, that should be simple. Um, and now we're getting into how do those <laughs> flying saucers work? But uh, I, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm in on that too. But at the end of the day, I believe that there are so many things that are that are popping up um, around us that it's it's absolutely it's absolutely staggering uh, the, the the possibilities. You know what? I just thought of something else. Um, I'm going to the Tesla takeover in California uh, on Friday, and uh, I leave on Friday, and uh, I'm the keynote speaker on Saturday, and May Musk is the keynote speaker. On Sunday, Elon's mom. Elon's mom. It just dawned on me. 
okay, so I'm big into electric cars and so she, but we're both in our 70s. When's the last time that you had two keynote speakers at, a, at an event like this and, and they're both in their 70s? Holy doodle. I, that's ponderous. I just... I, uh, 70's the new 50. 70's the new... F I don't know about that, but you know, got to start not wrecking the table here. But, but I mean, I, think about it. That's, that's ponderous. How come it isn't a kid? I mean, really and truly, um, that's amazing. I, I can't... I, we can cut this out. I'm, I'm sure that, <laughs> sure that uh, Eric is probably uh, deleting it even as we speak. But, but, you know, this is the kind of thing. It, it, this new, um, all this new stuff, is, it's kind of like thrilling to two, group, two age groups, the very, very young and the old. Everybody in the middle is, ah, whatever comes along, you know, that kind of thing. But it's, from a psychological standpoint, things are vastly different now. I mean, nobody dates, nobody wants to have a car, Nobody, uh, uh, nobody wants to have children, and but, but for some reason or other, we still keep muddling along. So, I don't know. I, I have no idea what the future is going to be, but it's got to be a lot more exciting than what we lived through uh, um, in the seventies, uh, eighties, and nineties. Oh, I, you know. I, I think right now we're living through one of the most transformational periods yeah. in the development of human civilization. Yeah, and I don't say that lightly. And, and it, it comes down to, and I'm pointing here so those listening know, to my cell phone. You know, yeah. I can call almost anybody in the world on this. I can communicate with just about anyone. I can look up all kinds of facts and figures. I've got the world's information at my fingertips. Encyclopedia Britannica in, Every, in, on a cell phone. That's, that's yeah. right. And so there's good and bad to that. You know, I love the connectivity. I love the, the access to information. But it also is a technology that allows a lot of bad people to get together yeah. that are able to connect and do bad things in ways that they were never able to do before. And now as a society, we're inundated, we're bombarded with information 24-7. You know, when you and I were growing up, if something big happened, oh, there was going to be film at 11. Yeah, and you had yeah. to wait until the 11 o'clock yeah. news to watch it. Now it's instantaneous. And it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Not only do you know all the information that's happening in the world, you know what's going on in your neighborhood. You know things that, you know, you would have never known in the past. Yeah. And this is why I think people feel down. They, they feel like the world's going in a bad way. Uh, and I'm saying, no, all that bad stuff always existed. Yeah. You just didn't know about it. Exactly right. And, you know, yeah. like the whole Black Lives Matter thing, and I'm not trying to make this political, I'm just trying to make a point. It would have never happened without a cell phone. If somebody hadn't been standing on the curb watching this cop kill this guy yeah. in broad daylight, yeah. that would have never happened. Yeah. And now we've got all this information, we're bombarded with it, and you know what sells? Bad news sells. Absolutely. I'm in the media. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. If it bleeds, it, it leads. Reads. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so everybody is getting all this bad information all the time, and they're going, oh, my God, everything's bad. And I tend to be a glass half full guy anyway. But, you know, I, I just look at the American economy. I, I've heard people say, boy, if the economy wasn't so bad. I'm going, what are you talking what are you, about? Exactly. You know, job growth is like we have never seen yeah. in our lifetimes. You know, uh, if you look at uh, the rate of inflation, yeah, it's come down tremendously. I think be what really caused it more than you know, government spending got a lot of blame. And, and I know that was a reason, but... The choked up supply chains were a bigger reason. Right. And now workforce participation, there was just an article, and I think it was the Wall Street Journal today, it's at a 20-year high. And here's the Fed trying to kill the economy, trying to kill it, and it just can't do it. And so I think people, I, I'm not trying to say, hey, ignore all the bad stuff. All I'm saying is put it in perspective. Yeah. You're far more aware of everything that was bad than anyone has ever been in the past. Mm -hmm. And so we need to learn how to deal with this new media. We haven't established the guardrails as they talk about. And so everybody thinks everything's going to hell in a handbasket. And uh, there are problems, but I don't think it's nearly as bad as people think it is. And it's certainly not worse than it was before. Well, you know, I think that there's a market for something. Um, my mother, uh, actually, uh, she uh, 
she used to wonder why we didn't have something. And it was called, it was kind of like a, the, um, uh, I can't remember my, I, I, I used it. Oh, uh, the Pollyanna channel, you know, where everything is wonderful and sunshine and butterflies and look at the kittens and stuff like that. So we have some of that stuff on, um, on uh, different people send me things. Look at the cat playing a piano. Yeah. Look at the guy with a little stick uh, making his hands go up and down. But at the end of the day, then maybe that's what there's a there's a there's a uh, like a a new TV channel like CNN only it's like um, and stay tuned Pollyanna will be right back you know that kind of stuff I think I think there might be something there because some people just get so overwhelmed by the the amount of bad news that's coming in and they take it all to heart and the next thing you know they got heart attacks or strokes or whatever maybe there's a maybe there's a, a channel out there that should be around so that. You don't have to watch all this stuff. And, oh, yeah, there is an atomic bomb, but don't worry about it. And then, you you know, let's get back to the kittens. Yeah. Well, I, I think we just, as a society, have to uh, learn how to process this. And it's not going to happen anytime soon. It, yeah. it, because, as you've mentioned, you know, tap the chip in your forehead and yeah. it will get things done for you instead of using a cell phone. There's more technology to come. And look at yeah. AI. Yeah. Chat GPT, Dall E. I mean, holy crap, if you thought we've had problems with media up to now, it's only getting going. I'll tell you what, we, um, we tried something out, um, and um, <laughs> the results were absolutely staggering. We asked for a report on something. Um, I can't remember what it was, uh, using one of the AI, AI channels. And, uh, and I said, um, or somebody said, and we want that in Elizabethan English. Mm-hmm. And in like seconds, yes. seconds, it pops up. And we're talking about something that's, and, and now I remember what it was. It's, I don't want to talk about that. But anyways, it's, it's fairly deep stuff. This is like highly technical and whatnot. And the next thing, uh, you know, uh, comes on is, lend me your ears. And the next thing you know, you're, going, you're listening to a Shakespeare speech talking about the most advanced um, stuff, like advanced uh, defense things, I mean, instantly. Instantly it came up with this. How did it find it first off? How did it translate it? How did it turn into, and then the inflections were perfect. How, how does that happen? How do you make that happen? So AI for people like, like uh, the writers are all in, uh, on uh, strike in California, I don't know if I'd want to strike because AI could maybe write a script in about oh, two it, seconds it, it and can, cost but nothing. I'll, I'll give you uh, my example. So I've been playing around with ChatGPT, and I thought, boy, wouldn't it be great if it could help us write the script for Autoline Daily? So if the audience doesn't know, we do a daily newscast right. on the auto industry every day. It's 10 minutes long. It's on YouTube and our, our uh, website. Anyway... So I go to ChatGPT and I say, use these sources and I want you to write a 250 word news article about the, the info in these sources. And yeah, five, 10 seconds later, there it is. But it was so dry. It was so boring. It was like boiled. eating cardboard. It boiled was like, English. So then I changed it a little bit and I said, use these sources, same ones, write a 250 word news article in the style of John McElroy at Auto Line. And damn, it was like, oh, it, no. was, it, was, it was me, but over the top, but that's okay because I can go in and edit that very quickly. But it was like, oh, okay, here's the secret. Yes, ChatGPT can do what you tell it to do, what you ask it to do, but that's the key. You've got to say, yeah. use this information, do it this way in the style like this, and then it can be brilliant. But it's still, I, so yeah, so when I tell people this, they go, oh, that's going to take over your job. And I go, no, 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 it's not. Because ChatGPT does not know what sources of information I want to use, yeah. and it doesn't know the length or the style I want it in. I've got to tell it that. And I'm okay with it doing all that work because yeah. it does it in seconds. Yeah. And, you know, I spend almost all day writing. I'm writing radio scripts. I'm writing speeches. I'm writing, you know. It, so if if I can tell it what to do when it writes it, and then all I've got to do is go in and clean it up, and I love editing anyway, 
I'm all for it. But I, I don't think uh, the Hollywood writers are going to be uh, threatened because I don't think the suits are going to know what to tell Chat GPT to write. Hmm. Well, that that may that may be the 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 truth, but then <clears throat> the suits. I'm wondering how many of them you need uh, <laughs> at the end of the day. So a, AI can take over a lot of different things, but you know what it can't? Plumber. You cannot uh, get AI right. to uh, to clean a uh, uh, a chog, uh, clogged uh, drain right. either. And can't weld. Can't weld. Can't. There's a, well, that's not true. I can get a robot to weld as long as I tell it what to do. True. But uh, but you can't. There are some things that it just. So when I was at Ford, we were working with AI, and this is in like eighty eight, eighty seven, eighty six, something like that. We had a AI group. And we were going to try and do a lot of different things. And some of them I didn't have anything to do with, but I was in this group called Technical Industrial Controls. So the system that I developed when I was at Ford, the one we use now, uh, the, the lean design stuff, that had its early beginnings as a, an expert system. It, it couldn't tell you what to do or how to do it, but what it could do is criticize whatever it is that you've done so far. <clears throat> and we still use it because we haven't figured out how to AI that one. But when we, when we tried to do a mill right, that's when we found out where the big hole is in AI. So a mill right comes over and, um, and uh, he has what's called a Rita stick. And Rita just the don't reach into automation. So anyway... Uh, he's got a Rita stick and he's standing there and we're listening to the, uh, you know, this machine and it, we got all kinds of goofy stuff going on, getting terrible parts out of it. Takes the Rita stick, he puts it onto the, onto the uh, housing, the casting that's on his big machine. Puts that on, puts it onto his forehead, pulls it back and he says, oh, it's number four bearing, uh, blah, blah, right here under there. We need to go through this gear train and yak, yak, and that's the bearing that's, that needs to come out. Well, how did you know that? Well, I don't know. I just don't. And here's the deal. With a lot of what we think is really important, you have a logic ladder. First I do this, then I look at that, then I do this, then I do that, then I do this, then I do that, then I come up with a solution. With a millwright, Here's the problem. Here's the answer. Yeah. It was a straight line. I mean, yeah. it's these, this guy's hardwired. Right. How do you beat that? You can't. So that's when we, we tossed in the towel. We were going to do mill rights, tool makers, uh, tin bangers, all these different, uh, different trades and whatnot. We threw in the towel. But the worst one, the one that was the hardest, was, was the plumber. <laughs> but, but the, you know, we, we tried this out and, um, and, uh, there, there's just no way because with some things I can put, like for instance, on the mill right, I, I can put um, um, sensors all over it. And by very vibration analysis, I can tell you where the, the, the sound is coming from. I know how to correct the problem once I know where it is. Okay. It'll be a bearing and push a button and there you go. But with a plumber, no. Do I know its roots? No. Can I put a sensor down there? I can put a camera down. Then what? I mean, that's it. And now I don't know what to. So at the end of the day, the closer we get to um, what I would call, I don't want to use the word primitive, but I can't think of, but, but original kinds of uh, trades and whatnot, the farther away AI is going to be. I can't understand how we're ever going to take somebody who's going to, you know, uh, chisel out another Madonna, like, uh, you know, it just isn't going to work that way. So I, I think that some things, we, we also had a, a program for an oncologist for, uh, for cancer and whatnot. It was right like 92% of the time, and the best oncologists are somewhere around 70. So, but nobody could figure out who was going to get sued, so that went away too. But I, I see a lot of future in AI, I see a lot of helpful things that can help, you know, get us to... Yeah, but we got to be careful. Did, we did you hear about this Air Force study that they did using AI? Yeah. They had uh, this bot that was trained to take out uh, anti-aircraft emplacements. 
And But before it could take them out, it had to communicate with a human and get permission to do it. And it was uh, programmed so that it knew the more radar or more uh, anti-aircraft installations it took out, the more points it got. And, and the goal was to get as many points as possible. So into the program, it recognizes that the human is a problem. It's got to con- communicate with the human. And sometimes the human says, no, don't destroy that. So the program killed the human. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and so they, they went, whoa, we don't want that. Uh, yeah. So the Air Force reprogrammed it and said, uh, okay, uh, you lose 50 points if you kill the human. And so the bot now knows, ooh, I, I can't win the game if I kill yeah. the human. So it destroyed the communication system with the human. Perfect. So it didn't have to kill it, but yeah. could go on destroying whatever it wanted. Yeah, well, there you go. What was the name of that uh, that that show where there was it was a cop in Detroit and uh, it was a robot kind of cop and RoboCop. RoboCop. It was a movie. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. It, I, it's a long time ago. I, I have a hard time remembering yesterday, let alone back there. But, but anyways, that's basically what you're, what you're bumping into is how do we, uh, how do we cl- and, control? And there's another we're... great instance too, where uh, a lawyer, uh, I think it was in Florida. You can look it up. It's, it, it's well known now. He had uh, ChatGPT create a. Uh, a legal case with all kinds of legal citations. Well, the bot couldn't come up with what he wanted, so it just made stuff up. <laughs> and this lawyer wow. was crazy enough, he actually submitted the case to a judge, and thank God it was a judge who knew his stuff and took one look at it and went, this is crap, this is this is made yeah. up, you know, all brilliantly cited with the right numbers, and but it was all made up. So yeah, we got to learn how to use AI. So is that is that lawyer now working at a different bar, or I, I, <laughs> instead of the bar going to the bar, he's probably working at the bar? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I I think they slapped his wrists. I don't think they disbarred him. Really? But uh, but it, it made oh, along with this Air Force case. This this is well known yeah. in the AI community that these things are happening and. If we know that, who knows what we don't know about? Usually it's like cockroaches. You see one, there's hundreds there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we were having a good time here right up until I thought about the storm that's coming up. And uh, so John is going to leave. <laughs> I tail it out of here. Yeah, I tile it. Yes. Uh, they're talking about tornadoes and whatnot. Yeah. Anyway, John, this has been great. I really, yeah. I really enjoy talking to you. Um, it's good that we got a chance to sort out where we met and whatnot. Um, you know, just in case somebody wants to know, where did you get engaged to John or something? But uh, but at the end of the day, uh, this was a lot of fun. It, it's always a lot of fun to talk with you. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I jumped at the chance to come out here, as uh, as always. And then you've got to come back on Autoline After Hours. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andy. Let me, uh, let me congratulate you on uh, a job well done. Thank yes. you. Excellent.